Hello friends, I'm Conrad and welcome to Bad Guy Breakdown, the series where we look at the most iconic villains to grace the silver screen. Wherefore was that cry? The Queen, my lord, is dead. She should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow. And tomorrow. And tomorrow. What is it about Macbeth that has made him such an enduring character? Is it the Shakespearean prose? The litany of wonderful actors who have played the part? Or is it something more fundamental than that? Do we all see in his tale of poisonous ambition a bit of ourselves? In adapting the Scottish play and displacing it to 16th century Japan, Akira Kurosawa answered one of these questions directly. Gone is the prose but the main character remains as compelling as ever, in no small part down to the memorable performance of Toshiro Mifune, Kurosawa stalwart and comfortably among the best to ever don the role. But he benefits hugely from having Kurosawa behind the camera, a master of visual storytelling and one of the founding fathers of action cinema. When you combine Mifune's wonderful performance, Kurosawa's ability to replace Shakespearean dialogue with stunning visuals and a concluding action sequence so breathtakingly violent that it hasn't aged a day in 70 years, you know you're getting something special. That something is Washizu Takatoki. Let's get into the villainy. We can't really discuss Washizu without also discussing Macbeth, that's just the reality of adaptations. So why not just make a video on Macbeth, I hear you cry. Well, firstly, fuck you, you're not the boss of me. And secondly, Washizu deserves his own video because he is both the best on-screen depiction of Macbeth, and also a pretty distinct character in his own right, wonderfully portrayed by the inimitable Toshiro Mifune. This wasn't the first time Mifune had played a villain. Hell, it wasn't even the first time he had played a villain in an Akira Kurosawa Chambara movie. But in portraying Washizu only three years after his turn as the heroic, if manic, Kikuchio in Seven Samurai, it allows us to draw some fascinating comparisons between the two. The latter being the orphaned son of a farmer who distrusts samurai and chooses to fight and die for the common man. A far cry from Washizu who, while a soldier in his own right and depicted as relatively noble, has his gaze fixed upwards rather than on the peasantry. I don't think this was necessarily the result of some conscious decision by either Mifune or Kurosawa, but the contrast between the roles is interesting. And it says a lot about Mifune as an actor that he was able to play both parts so convincingly his own particular brand of wild energy, finding root in Kikuchio's passionate zeal and Washizu's desperate ambition equally. It's the equivalent of Robert Downey Jr. going from playing Iron Man to the lead in a Jeffrey Bezos biopic or something. Ugh. It should go without saying, given the range of roles that Mifune played, but it speaks to the talent of the man, and it makes Washizu instantly memorable. But if Mifune is responsible for filling out the role with his own boisterous talent, then it's only fair to credit Kurosawa's writing for shaping it, and to do that we need to look at how his character differs from that of Shakespeare, as well as the similarities between them. And they are similar, obviously. Both are relatively honourable soldiers, undone by their own ambitions. Both end up 
murdering a king and a best friend. Both have hair, I guess. Look, they're the same fucking character on the broad strokes, alright? But Washizu isn't just the Japanese equivalent of the Thane of Kordor, differing in what I count to be two key areas. First, his relationship with his wife, and second, how he meets his end. We'll dedicate an entire chapter later to talking about Lady Macbeth, Araji in Throne of Blood, because she is such a central character to the story, arguably deserving of a breakdown in her own right. But broadly speaking, it's safe to say that unlike Lord and Lady Macbeth, Washizu and Araji don't actually like each other all that much. And that's important for understanding Washizu as a character. Where Macbeth is manipulated by someone he loves into following his own worst instincts, Washizu is kind of needled into it. He has this frustrated, henpecked quality that stems from his marriage, like he's constantly trying to prove Araji wrong. It reminds me a little of Jerry Lundegaard in Fargo, but, you know, Jerry with swords. Okay, real good then. A man who is so insecure that he actively ruins a good thing by attempting to advance his own position. There's no disapproving father-in-law, and Jerry actually seems to like his wife, kidnapping aside. But in Mifune's nervous, snappy disposition around Araji, you can definitely see that his ambition is at least partially rooted in insecurity. Actually, they both kind of suffer the same ignominious end, too. Maybe there's a separate video to be had here. Rupert! Take note of that! You... Okay, good. Okay, that ends though. Let's talk about it. The first thing to make clear is that Macbeth's demise is obviously a lot more personal than Washizu's, slain in single combat by Macduff, another thane of the murdered King Duncan and loyal servant of his son Malcolm. It's... it's a whole thing. And while the final act of Throne of Blood keeps part of the prophecy that fills its protagonist with confidence, that he won't fall until a forest marches on his castle, it does away with the no man from woman born can harm you bit. This means that the characters of Macduff, Malcolm and Fleance, Noriyasu, Tsuzuki Kunimaru and Miki Yoshiteru in this version are pretty much relegated to side characters. They march around a bit, sure, but their threat to Washizu goes almost entirely unrealised. To put it another way, Washizu goes and gets himself shot to pieces by his own men before his enemies even start sieging his castle. Cause you had a bad day, you take it one down, you sing a sad song just to turn it around. So, why did that change? Well, for a start, I think it makes the story easier to tell. You can relegate your side characters to the background once Washizu has committed an act of violence on their family and coalesce all of them into one big spiky ball of soldiers at the end. We don't really need to understand them because they exist purely to support the allegory and then act as one of either the rock or the hard place that Washizu finds himself between at the conclusion. And that means we can spend more time with Washizu himself, the character on which the whole of Throne of Blood rests. As well as that, it means that the violent death of Washizu can be depicted in a much more symbolic way. There's no great rush to reintroduce Noriyasu to the story so we can root for him in their final duel. Instead, Kurosawa relishes the idea of this conclusion being more metaphor than anything else. Washizu's mist-shrouded men turning on him as he panically races around the battlements of his own castle is very clearly the consequences of his own actions coming back to haunt him. Literally the ghosts of his past yanking him and all he has achieved back down into the ground. And while the theme of impermanence exists in both Throne of Blood and Macbeth, Kurosawa takes it to an extreme, removing almost any kind of grounded narrative for his main character's death, and instead making these final moments all about the theme. The changes to the conclusion of Throne of Blood give us a distilled view of the allegory behind it. That ambition can corrupt even the best of us. But while Macbeth initially presents its protagonist as a loyal and good man with a loving marriage, 
I don't know if you can say the same for this. Yes, Washizu dismisses the suggestion that he will replace his lord when it is first made to him, but the performance of Mifune, to me, says that it really didn't take much to get his character thinking of betrayal. The tragedy of Washizu feeling less like a tragedy and more like the inevitable downfall of a not very nice person. Likewise, while Mr and Mrs Macbeth descend into conspiratorial plotting as a result of their love and implicit trust in one another, Washizu and Araji begin their scheming while kind of hating each other. These distinctions might be partially down to the change in setting to feudal Japan and what this means for the believable presentation of nobles, but to understand how Washizu manages to remain compelling when the tragedy of his character is all but erased, we need to look at the lady sat beside him in a little more detail. The naming of a character or popular figure as a Lady Macbeth has kind of become a cultural shorthand for a manipulative woman who causes the downfall of a good man with her meddling, someone who sits in the background and doesn't take an active role but aspires to greatness anyway. It's a coward, essentially, and I've always found that to be a bit unfair on the character. Yes, she encourages her husband to act on his own ambitions but they are ultimately his ambitions, and although she is the character who initially floats the idea of the murders they commit, let's be real here, Macbeth is a big boy, he could have said no. And although Macbeth is normally the one left with the task of actually performing them, it's very clear in her dialogue that she would take the burden of rulership and the guilt of these crimes onto herself if only she weren't held back by her biological sex. So. When people are looking for a character with which to label the archetype of the manipulative, secretive woman, troubling though it may be, they'd actually be better off using Araji rather than Lady Macbeth. Where the latter is warm and loving to her partner, Araji is antagonistic and spiteful. Where Lady Macbeth is full of assurances that should she and her husband fail, they will fail together, Araji speaks purely in terms of her husband's power and never even countenances the possibility of failure. They are, in many ways, the absolute opposite in terms of their relationships to their husbands. So much so that even though both end up achieving the same thing, it's not unreasonable to wonder whether Kurosawa intended for us to have a different reaction to Araji, which makes it interesting that, of the two, Araji is the only one who might possibly survive. The last time she is seen or mentioned coming in the adaptation of the out damned spot scene, where she furiously tries to scrub her hands of blood that only she can see. However, I think the fact that no time is spent informing Washizu that his wife has died is more a function of pacing than theming. Doing so would interrupt the singular focus of the finale, providing information that isn't essential to the climax of Washizu's story. She is, for all intents and purposes, dead at the end of Throne of Blood, even if no one explicitly says it. And not explicitly saying things is sort of a hallmark of Kurosawa, definitely of Throne of Blood specifically. In adapting Shakespeare for a primarily Japanese audience, the director wisely chose not to try and replicate the flowery prose in his script and instead used his camera, blocking and style to flood the screen with visual storytelling. It's how we can arrive at the conclusion that Washizu and Araji really don't like each other despite them exchanging a fraction of the dialogue of the original couple, or how we can know exactly what Washizu was thinking without a word spoken. Kurosawa was one of the absolute masters of compelling narratively driven visuals, and his employment of them in Throne of Blood is part of what elevates Washizu Takatoki as a villain. I want to look at two scenes from Throne of Blood, which exemplify Kurosawa's skill of telling a story with what the audience sees, rather than what they hear. To do this, you're going to have to indulge me some more Shakespeare quotes, 
I'm going to show you clips of a Kurosawa scene without explaining what is happening, and then compare it to the corresponding Macbeth scene. And at the end, if I've done my job, we'll all agree that Kurosawa got the same ideas across with far fewer words. One small point first, this isn't intended as a criticism of Shakespeare. Movies and theatre are inherently different mediums. A stage, particularly an old-fashioned thrust stage where the actors are performing to people on three sides of them, requires big gestures and verbose dialogue to get points across. That Kurosawa is able to mine every bit of his framing and blocking to get these same points across in a more subtle way is a sign of his greatness in the medium of film, not of a failing of Shakespeare's in the medium of theatre. So, the first scene. It's our introduction to Araji. Washizu has just been made a minor noble in charge of a garrison of soldiers, confirming the first part of an ominous prophecy delivered to him by a spirit. We open on a static wide shot of the noble couple, and then cut to a medium two shot with them sat on opposite sides of the frame, Washizu's back to his wife. This says something about their relationship. This doesn't seem like a couple who enjoy each other's company, right? In Throne of Blood, the camera motion is normally tied to Washizu's mood. When he is energetic, so is the camera. When he is subdued, the camera is likewise. So the lack of camera movement in the early part of this scene suggests a lack of energy, a kind of frustrated tolerance of his wife. You don't really need to understand what is being said here to get the tone of the scene. That's visual storytelling using the positioning of actors and camera movement. Then, highlighting the fact that Washizu has become physically agitated, the camera moves with him, his wife becoming a disembodied voice that still speaks to him from off screen. When he walks back to her and sits down, revealing that she still hasn't moved, the camera follows. When she proposes something to him, his first instinct is to dismiss her, but his movement belies the fact that his wife's proposal has intrigued him. He turns to face her, and they are brought physically closer together in the frame. He stares at her intently, though Araji only meets her husband's gaze to antagonise him into doing what she asks. And then, finally, as news reaches the couple that brings their plotting to a crucial crossroads where they must make a decision, the rushed camera movement begins in earnest, following Washizu from his seated position, to the gantry outside, and then to his sword. The stillness of the conversation prior brilliantly contrasting the nervous energy of the scene towards its conclusion. As an introduction to Araji, you can't get much more definitive than this. At the start of this scene, the audience knows that Washizu is technically the one with all the power, yet his blocking and the way the camera follows him has been temperamental and erratic. His wife, meanwhile, has been almost completely motionless, like a coiled snake. In one scene, we know all we need to know about these two people and their relationship, and who truly holds the power in it. Let's now compare this to Macbeth. It's almost an exact copy of Act 1, Scene 5 of the play. Lady Macbeth receives a letter confirming Macbeth's promotion and the prophecy given to him by witches that he will become king. She speculates whether her husband has the mean streak necessary to achieve this prophecy before he arrives with news that King Duncan will stay with them tonight. Lady Macbeth proposes killing Duncan, and Macbeth doesn't hate the idea. Scene. Now, Shakespeare said brevity is the soul of wit, but he never mentioned anything about being able to speak Japanese. So I'm going to do something vaguely controversial and compare the English translation of Throne of Blood to Shakespeare. It's obviously not going to be 100% accurate, but we're not doing rocket science here and it broadly gets the point across. The point being that the scene from Macbeth includes 599 words of spoken dialogue, the scene from Throne of Blood, 376, over 200 less. Even accounting for the change in mediums and the shift of setting to allow for more brusque manners of speaking, that's some economic script writing. And more to the point, 
So much of what is achieved by this scene in terms of characterization goes unsaid, or at the very least is wonderfully supported by the blocking and framing of Washizu and Araji, where Lady Macbeth gets an entire monologue about her own feelings, concerns and motivations, Araji gets about eight lines to explain why she thinks the Lord Suzuki might kill them if he finds out about the prophecy, and that Miki might tell him. She's positively meek compared to her Shakespearean counterpart. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall. Although, one area where Araji is actually given more time to develop than Lady Macbeth is in the realm of child rearing. She falls pregnant about halfway through Throne of Blood, spurring Washizu to kill Miki, whose children are prophesied to inherit his lordship. Something Lady Macbeth never does. In fact, she only mentions a child once, in passing, saying that she has known the intimacy of breastfeeding a child and would happily have killed it to achieve her ambitions of becoming a ruler. It's pretty dark stuff, but the key thing to note here is that Kurosawa deliberately alters the stakes for Washizu by including a potential heir, so that his fall from grace feels even more pronounced. At the onset of the third act, Kurosawa's own version of a Greek chorus explained that Washizu has alienated anyone loyal to him. We cut from an external shot of the castle to a wide shot of the Lord sat in his chambers. And even before we know that bad news is on the way, the framing of the shot tells us a lot about what is going to happen. Compare it to this scene where he learned that Araji was pregnant. Yeah, it's tense, but it's wide open. The room is theirs to wander around in, there's no items splitting the frame or encroaching darkness to give a sense of claustrophobia. Here, Washizu is relegated to the background of the shot, and is framed so aggressively by the doors to his chambers that he barely makes up a third of it. It's oppressive, like the environment he has created for himself at Spider's Web Castle. The kind of visual language that screams, your wife has lost the baby and also everyone hates you. There's no Shakespearean equivalent for this precise scene, but we can instead consider it in the context of its position in the movie, acting as a sort of gatekeeper to the third act, which is essentially a non-stop cavalcade of desperately bad news. Washizu at this point in the movie, even when at rest, is absolutely surrounded by the encroaching disaster. The repercussions of his actions are well on their way to delivering retribution, and we know it from what Kurosawa shows us, even if Washizu doesn't. There's one final point I want to make on the skill of Kurosawa to realise a setting through his visuals. Macbeth is a misty fucking play. Maybe the mistiest. And the director knew this when he made Throne of Blood, choosing to build all of the external sets on the foggy slopes of Mount Fuji, and filling most of the stuff they shot in studios with, frankly, outrageous amounts of fog. It achieves two things. First, it maintains the ethereal horror elements of the play. There are ghosts and witches here, and the tone needs to allow for that, in a way that doesn't make anything seem ridiculous. One need only look at the scenes with the forest spirit standing in for the witches, or Miki's ghost at the feast, to see how committed Kurosawa was to realising the more grim elements of this story. And second, it fills the screen with something he was a fan of in many of his movies, natural motion. Whether it be wind, fire, dust, rain, or in this case fog, Kurosawa loved to utilise weather to make his images feel rich, and each mist-shrouded scene in Throne of Blood is a stunning example of it. I think one of the biggest reasons that Macbeth has endured in a way that many other Shakespeare plays have not is because it is fundamentally a very exciting play. There are two battle scenes in it, whose depiction varies depending on who is telling the story, but Generally speaking, most adaptations seem to take the opportunity to have some good old-fashioned sword fights. In short, it's a play with plenty of action, and in Akira Kurosawa, Macbeth found itself being adapted by the godfather of action cinema.
When you think of great action scenes of the last 60 years, there's at least two things they normally have in common, and you might not even notice them until they're done badly. Editing and sound design. The idea of cutting on action, showing cause and effect of, say, a gun firing, isn't something Akira Kurosawa invented. Directors were doing that as far back as early westerns. He didn't even invent the idea of shortening your shots to increase pacing. But you need only watch one of those old westerns to feel the difference between what a director like Raoul Walsh was doing in the 40s and what Kurosawa was doing only a decade later. Many of the climactic battle sequences of these movies feel quite repetitive and stagey. Wide shot of cowboys firing guns, wide shot of Native Americans falling off of horses, repeat several times, then interject some close-ups of a fist or sword fight, fill the score with dramatic strings, and call it a day. The directors and editors of these movies understood that cutting between someone shooting and someone being shot maintained visual continuity, and shortening the length of time between these cuts gave the scene a faster, more exciting pace. But action and reaction often feel like they're happening independent of each other in movies like this, and it makes the scene feel disorienting. There's no thought for showing action and reaction in the same shot, or carrying visual elements of one shot to another to help establish a sense of space. In this scene from the final battle sequence of Walsh's They Died With Their Boots On, look at the movement of the natives on horseback. Sometimes they're moving sideways, sometimes they're at an angle, and sometimes they're charging straight towards the camera as they die. It doesn't feel like there's much thought to how they're moving relative to the people shooting at them. And then when we cut back to a wide shot of the US cavalry holding position against the charge, we see that the ground is littered with their own dead, but we're yet to see a single American soldier die. There's very little thought for visual consistency in these cuts, never mind space or setting, and so the violence lacks weight. A gun fires, some guy falls off a horse. There's no sign of a bullet impact, this being well before the days of squibs, so the only way to get consistency between action and reaction would be to establish a sense of space. Show the person being shot in relation to the person shooting. But movies didn't really do this before Kurosawa. They were happy enough to show the hero doing something heroic, like shooting someone. The reaction to that was deemed unimportant, something you had to do to give your action sequence visual continuity, but not something that could improve the sequence by itself. In Seven Samurai, Kurosawa said, hey fuck that, actually, and revolutionised action cinema by showing action and reaction relative to each other. For example, here we set the scene with a wide shot showing the bandits and villagers together with their surroundings clearly visible, then cut to a sequence of close-ups as they are pulled from their horses, then show both of their deaths. One as they climb a barricade we saw in the background of the first shot, another stumbling through the walls of a house we also saw several times prior to their death. Kurosawa spent this entire collection of shots priming the audience to fully understand where and how both these men died and as such, their deaths feel related to the action on screen. Two deaths here, worth more than a hundred Italians pretending to be Native Americans falling off of horses. And if he mastered the sense of place of action in Seven Samurai, he mastered the sense of pace of action in Throne of Blood. Thematically speaking, by the end of this movie, Washizu Takatoki is cruising for a bruising. He has pissed off or murdered literally everyone who is close to him and is utterly isolated and trapped by the consequences of his actions. The retribution he is about to suffer is going to be, frankly, pretty righteous. And Kurosawa knew exactly how to capture extreme violence. First, ditch the score. The soundscape of the conclusion here is going to be filled with two things, Washizu's desperate screams and the deafening shrieks of dozens of arrows as his soldiers turn on him en masse. There's a purity to the sound design here that we'll get back to in a minute when we talk about directors who were influenced by this. Second, action and reaction. Show Washizu's movement as he runs from his traitorous men, cut mid-movement to maintain the flow, 
and then show Washizu and the reaction to the action in the same shot. In short, show Toshiro Mifune's wild panic as arrows punch through the walls around him, which, by the way, they achieved by actually just firing real goddamn arrows at their leading man. The source of the action, the archers, isn't actually that important here because there's very little interaction between Washizu and his men once the violence starts. So, Instead, we see Kurosawa choose to keep his focus almost exclusively on his protagonist as he desperately tries to escape, the camera dwelling on his horrified expression as he is slowly turned into a human pincushion. And last, speed up the time between cuts as the scene hurtles towards its bloody conclusion. Not a new editing technique by any means, but one that Kurosawa took to new heights with this scene when combined with his eye for shooting action. What starts as a fairly long cowboy shot of Washizu roaring at his men ends with faster and faster reaction shots to the arrows, reaching an outrageously overblown climax where each shot is only a second or so long, before a single shaft punches through Washizu's back, followed by another through his neck, the editing then lingering on his death throes while the sound design is reduced to the staggered footsteps of a dying man, and then finally to just the wind. This cacophony of violence might seem familiar to fans of more recent movies. Fans of, say, Sam Peckinpah, one of dozens, if not hundreds, of directors who owe their most famous action sequences to Throne of Blood. The Wild Bunch took what Kurosawa did here and turned it up several notches. Much more blood, much more swearing, but the bones of the scene are the same. The score stripped down to just gunfire and the cries of the dying the sense of space between actor and reactor on every single shot. Peckinpah was on another level when he made this, holy shit. And the fast cuts of Kurosawa sped up even more, to the point where you can feel the scene threatening to fly apart at the hinges if it gets any quicker. Without Kurosawa, you probably don't get Peckinpah's Wild Bunch. The influence of Throne of Blood echoes into modern cinema. You can see it in more recent westerns, the Hong Kong action scene of the late 80s and early 90s, the work of superstar directors like Quentin Tarantino or Robert Rodriguez. Whether you're fighting with a samurai sword or charging down a line of cops while Freebird plays in the background, almost all of modern action sequences can be boiled down to the distilled influence of Akira Kurosawa, action and reaction space and setting. All of this is a very long-winded way of saying that with Washizu Takatoki, the director took a source material, Macbeth, that was ready-made for a seminal action director like himself and made his death iconic. Not just an onslaught of loud, terrifying violence in its own right, but an end that would define an entire genre of cinema. And when your character's death is as impactful as that, how can you consider them anything but iconic too? So, that's Throne of Blood. It's one of my favourite Kurosawa movies, and Washizu is a villain who simply cannot be ignored as one of the all-time greats. From Mifune's performance, to Kurosawa's presentation of the character in both life and death, he stands as perhaps the greatest adaptation of a Shakespearean character to the silver screen. And that's going to do it for us this time on Bad Guy Breakdowns. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like and consider subscribing as it really does help. And join us next time as we take a look at obsessive fan culture taken to a violent extreme with Annie Wilkes in Stephen King's Misery. Until then, I've been Conrad, and I'll see you next time.